I mean, I asked the question for a little while, well, you know, what is central Queensland? Like, what, what are the borders here? How far south does it go past Gladstone, you know, and how far north? So uh, I finally submitted the task of defining it to Neil Fisher, Councillor Neil Fisher, who, the moment I asked him, he knew exactly. He said, oh, yeah, it's bounded by, you know, this mountain range here, this mountain range there, blah, 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 blah. So I sent a map in, and he's drawn it on a map for me, and I'll show you, not today. And uh, because I had been feeling that this region, all the way to the border, is like a, a slice across cent the centre of Queensland, but it's, it's got definite mountain ranges and uh, catchment areas and whatnot, certain valleys that define it. And uh, like anything, of course, it, it gets rubbery in that sometimes some of the people who live in what is technically Queensland are closer to Mackay than Rocky by Road and that kind of thing. But <clears throat> we'll show you that some other time. Either way, I have felt the grace of God is meant to really move on central Queensland. And there's a bit of a history to this. And it's only uh, the more recent history is that in 2013, when Hazel was running for federal election, Justin Morgan and I took three days to drive every main road, not just the highways, but all the tributary roads in the whole of the electorate. The electorate of Capricornia is quite large and it's a fair piece of central Queensland, it's not the whole thing. But I wanted to drive every road and pray in every town and pray non-stop along every road. And so we left Rocky here at first light one morning and headed north and, uh, and crisscrossed the country and came all the way back and we filled up three days and we, from dawn to dusk, we never shut up praying. The whole time we're driving, one of us had to keep praying. And uh, then we'd stop in the heart of every town, pray over the town. So it took three days. And ostensibly the reason we were doing that was to um, cr create a better grace for the election and to bind spirit activity and cut off the claims of man and, you know, free things up. But the interesting thing is that we had no sooner begun than just driving north, we'd stopped and prayed at the caves and we're heading for Yamba. When our prayers opened up, Justin saw it and felt it keenly, and I saw it too, and we began to pray and over three days kept coming back to a much bigger prayer that what the Lord wanted to do was to move by power and grace, not just on Capricornia, but over this much bigger thing called central Queensland. And so we began to include in our prayers all kinds of requests for this much bigger area. And I felt the Lord was saying, Justin felt the same, that he wanted to transform the whole region economically, uh, socially, culturally, politically, spiritually, a complete transformation, and that central Queensland could be, was meant to be, uh, not a Bible belt, but a Jesus belt. And um, so we prayed into that, and ever since I've wanted to go, and pray in every single town in the entire region, but haven't pulled that off yet, and yet we should. Um, more things have happened since then, but it was just this week I was reflecting on the fact that when I first came to Rockhampton 32 years ago as a Salvation Army officer, and knew that I would only be here two years, knew that I would be moved on, and in that period where I did not think we were going to be living in Rockhampton more than a short time. The Lord right then in 1986 told me very clearly that 100,000 souls would come to Christ across central Queensland. And that this was basically Rockhampton and a huge number of other people in the region. And so I was praying for this before I was a pastor in the city and before uh, it ever transpired that we put our roots down here. And when I came to peace in 1988, 
I shared that with the peace of those days and we had many prayer meetings. Uh, in fact, most prayer meetings we had, this subject came up of praying for Rockhampton to be saved. Every man, every woman, every child, praying for the region and so on. And so in years past, there was actually a great deal of prayer about what was meant to happen through this whole region. Uh, it's true, as David said, in more recent times, more re years and years really, we've poured prayer into the city more than the region. And yet this region, uh, the Lord seems to have his eye on something bigger. Now, what came to light this week was that David wrote an email to the rest of us on the staff pointing out that a survey had been conducted recently relative to Australia as to which was the most progressive and the most uh, conservative. Now, progressive and conservative are loaded terms in politics. Progressive means anything goes. Take all morality out of laws. Uh, sexual identity politics is big. I mean, all the really weird stuff that you get out of the Greens and a whole bunch of other people and a fair slice of Labor now is, is what they call progressive, but it's unclean, it is evil, it is immoral, it is, it is anti-Christian, and this kind of stuff tends to hate the church, hate Christianity. It, it wants to give everybody a voice except Christians. That's progressive. There's a lot of Marxism, is it? Neo-Marxism and a whole lot of other things. Conservative, now we're not talking left and right in politics, although often it's similar to those patterns, but conservative, as far as the survey was concerned, had to do with, you know, traditional family values, old-fashioned family values, the kind of things that Christians would stand for, and the Bible... And the survey revealed that Queensland is the most conservative state in Australia and you happen to live in the most conservative part of the most conservative state in Australia. And specifically, and it put up a graph that showed all the federal electorates, electorates of Australia listed from the most progressive to the most conservative, and you can read down the list, and on the graph, you know, the dots come down, all, all heading off in one direction. And when you get to the very bottom of the list, the four most conservative federal election, electorates in Australia are, uh, in reverse order, fourth last, well, if you see the graph, they're all right over here, Capricornia, uh, Kennedy, Flynn, and Maranoa. There's basically a whole swathe of central Queensland and whatever else. And David pointed out there is something about Queensland and there is something about central Queensland in particular. It really could be a Jesus belt. And also raised the thought that it's probably our prayers of these 30 years, as well as who knows who else's prayers, but we've been focused to a large degree on this. It's probably our prayers that have held the ground for biblical values. So that even now Capricornia amongst these electorates, and Kennedy, I think, for that matter, is, is on paper is, is more Labor than Liberal. Um, but even where people tend to be more Labor than Liberal in their thinking, they're conservative. So this is like the old-fashioned Labor values rather than these new, modern, trendy and unclean ones. And uh, so there's, there's something about it. And yes, it could well be that more than 30 years of prayer is holding the ground. Well, what does that say to you? I, I know what it says to me. Why didn't we pray more? And here we are. This is a huge opportunity because a lot of this word is fresh. 
like words I was getting were as recent as 2013 and as recently as last year when I felt to really look at it all again. David's words about, you know, CQ being our, our parish, not our parish, our diocese, or his at least, um, this is current. I think, now what it says to me is, if our prayers have held this ground, uh, we ought to redouble our efforts, but this time, really believing. We ought to be praying, but really believing God to transform the region. Not just the city, and not just what you might define as CQ, but something even a bit bigger. The borders are porous, and the grace of God is always wanting to flow, and Jesus loves every person in the nation. But of course, wherever he can establish a work, he will establish a work. He's not going to wait for you if someone else is ready to believe. His power and grace will flow wherever people are willing to pray and believe. In fact, I felt I heard the Lord say yesterday that if we make the effort in prayer, he answers the prayers. It's up to us to make the effort in prayer. You can't sit around thinking, well, I hope the Lord does a bit more or, you know, or I think good things are planned. No, you make the effort in prayer, the Lord answers the prayers. And so you do, there does have to be discipline, personal application to duty, sense of opportunity, sense of what can be achieved. You know, not, not remaining on the back foot, but pressing in and believing God. The Bible constantly calls for boldness. You know, walk into the presence of God and believe and call on his name and say, Lord, you're this kind of God and you said you'd do this and I call on your name now. Do this. That, that kind of bold praying as well as the times when you sit and shut up and listen to God because he'll have things to say and we, we need to do both of these things. Could I ask that we strengthen our morning prayers at 6 a.m. every morning Monday to Saturday, called to nine for that matter on Sunday mornings, there's a prayer meeting here and there's a different leader every day. And uh, I want good prayer groups. When, since we started that three years ago, it made a big difference. But we need to remember our task. We need to remember that what we're doing, as difficult as it might be to get out of bed, get to a prayer meeting, this is... This is where you discipline yourself and make the effort and he answers the prayers. I've been here long enough to know that we, were, we got amazing outcomes of prayer, but we didn't always see the amazing outcomes for 10 years. Some of the biggest breakthroughs we ever had in this church came 14 years after we started to pray. You make the effort, God answers the prayers, some things he gives you immediately. Some things, there's a waiting and believing time, and then he gives it to you suddenly. Some things, he promises it, and you're supposed to keep believing because there's a, a work of God that is slowly, slowly building toward that thing, and you can't see it until all of a sudden you realize, my, things have changed. You must always, though, trust the Lord that when you start putting things in his hands, he is acting on your behalf. It's, it's pretty astounding. He promised he would, and he does, and it's something in which he doesn't fail. He keeps his word. His eye is on you. I just, I just thank God for it. Anyway, I want to strengthen the 6 a.m. prayer meetings, and you don't have to come to six. You need to pick one and say, that's the one. I'm going to turn up, no matter how I feel, and put the effort in. Uh, Friday night, we need to strengthen youth prayer too. So that every time we meet for prayer, it doesn't matter how you feel. Now, by the way, please, please don't make the mistake of thinking that you've got to feel good when you pray to get a prayer answered. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's got nothing to do with your feelings. It's got nothing to do with whether you even feel you're praying well. It's got nothing to do with whether you feel the Lord is close. It's got nothing to do with whether you feel that, oh, when we started to pray, oh, the presence of God is here. It's got nothing to do with it. 
Sometimes you feel the presence of God and sometimes you don't, but it has nothing to do with the fact you offered prayer, he heard the prayer, you set your heart to believe. And the other thing is, it's not even dependent on whether you think you're really believing. You're simply meant to make up your mind that you want to believe God and that he did say these things and you're looking to him to do it. And you might think you're not doing a very good job of believing, but he said you don't need much, like a grain of, like a mustard seed. You imagine a thing as small as a grain of sand. You've only got to have this measure of faith. In other words, what about the fellow who said to the Lord, Lord, if you can, uh, you can heal my son. And Jesus said, if you can. Anything is available to him who believes. It was like a little rebuke. And his reply, the man's reply was, Lord, I do believe. He's, he suddenly realized that's what he had to say to get his prayer. Yeah, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief, he says. Lord answered his prayer. And, and your task is not to feel that you're believing or not to pray so much that you feel, oh, I think I'm finally believing. No, your task is simply to make a choice. I choose to believe God. I'm going to ask the Lord, and Lord, I'm setting my heart to believe you. And you say this to the Lord, no matter what you're feeling. And that's what faith is. Faith is not the feelings you have. Faith is something entirely other. And mostly you'll think you don't have it when you do have it. So the idea is, apply yourself, press into prayer, do something about it. Um, I've got a couple of minutes in which I want to remind you um, of a message that is an old friend of mine, and I guess it's on the website, and I guess it's in our app, and it'll be called something like, um, you know, Six Conditions for Answered Prayer. And if you can't find it, we'll help you. And uh, this was a message I used to preach years ago. Every now and again, I'd come to some place back in the 70s and the 80s, and give them this word. I remember going down to Gla some church in Gladstone and preaching this word. And I can remember having preached it twice in peace in 30 years. There are not many messages I repeat, but that's occasionally one of them. And what happened was, when I was first baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1974, suddenly I found this overwhelming love of God and authority the Lord did something rather special for me, I thought. It was as if he took me in hand and taught me how to pray so that I would always have my prayers answered. And there were six things he showed me, and it's like these are the conditions for answered prayer. But when we say the conditions for answered prayer, it's more like these are the areas in which make, you make sure you have conditioned your heart. In other words, you've tuned your heart up in, in six ways and that makes it easy to pray and this is where you get the, your prayers answered. So I'm going to just remind you of what they are. There's no time to go through them in depth and give all the illustrations and the scriptures I normally would, but I, I want to put you in the picture if, you, if, if in your daily walk with God you just double-check occasionally that these are the conditions of your heart, then you have every reason when you pray prayers to trust your prayers are being answered. Now, the first is this. Have you noticed how often in the Gospels the Lord says he'll answer all your prayers? For example, he says, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. He says, you can ask the Father for anything in my name, and he will do it. He says, ask and seek and knock. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. To him who knocks, the door will be open. He, he kept saying a lot of things to convince us that he really wanted to answer prayer and that we could come to him with any request and he would answer it. But what, what does it mean? How to understand this so that you're, you're always in the place where you can believe God. Well, here's what the Lord showed me. First of all, there's a little passage I read to you from John 15. Listen to its component parts. 
Jesus said, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me is like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now what's the overwhelming weight of that passage. This is John 15. The overwhelming weight is that a very big part of it is living in Christ, living in him. Now, you must understand a truth. When you first believed and were born again, you were placed in Christ and Christ was placed in you. And these are not two different things. It's just hard with human language to describe what we have. But if you're a believing Christian, you are in Christ. And Christ is in you. And it's, it's all one thing. You've become one with him. You've identified with him. And he's identified with you. And this is really, really important ground. Before you go anywhere, you must have a faith that says, I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. Now, that's the critical thing. And with that faith, then, you must do something about seeing to it that every day you live in him. There are people who put their faith in Christ and they're placed in Christ, but the way they daily live, they kind of drift. And so they become more worldly. Their, their life reflects the world rather than Christ, even though they were placed in Christ. They haven't been removed from Christ, but they're not living in him. That's, that's a clear distinction. But Jesus said, if you want your prayer answered, and if you want to be really fruitful, you must really... The old language was abide. This modern language is remain but it means to live in him. You're not living just for yourself. You're not living just for the world. You're living in Christ. You remain in Christ. You abide in Christ. And he tacks onto that, and my word lives in you. And the interesting thing is, if you will be a regular Bible reader, even if it's just half a chapter or a few verses every day, you sit and you, and you read it slowly and ponder it and take it in, It's amazing what a huge difference that makes as against living life without doing that. It it really creates an entirely different spiritual atmosphere. What you'll find is reading your Bible like that goes a long way to fulfilling this condition of remaining in Christ and his word remaining in you. It's not just that you became a Christian, but you're living in it. You're walking in it. This is what powerfully, powerfully positions you. That when you speak, he responds. And your prayers have so much more power. So that was condition one. Condition two was praying in his name. Because he says, you may ask anything for me, uh, of me in my name. And I've often pointed out over the years, as Steve Holmstrom did here just a few weeks ago, that praying in the name of Jesus... Um, my way of putting it was, you don't just tack this phrase on the end of your prayer like saying abracadabra. You know, you, you, you pray and pray and pray and pray, in the name of Jesus, amen. It's not abracadabra, amen. No, the, the magic, so to speak, the grace or the power of Christ or the response of the Lord or the affirmation of God to your prayer is not simply because you use the phrase. No, something else. We use the phrase because of the realities of what we believe and the person we represent. So praying in the name of Jesus actually means something much more like, I'm in Christ 
and Christ is in me, and when I pray, I'm praying with the mind of Christ, and, and my life represents Christ, and when I pray to the Father to do these things, I'm praying on behalf of Jesus. And when I approach the Father, he receives me because I'm in Jesus. So every prayer we pray is meant to be a representative prayer. It's a bit like being given the right to sign somebody else's checkbook. And that happened to me once. It happened years ago in this church, that someone in this church had funds that they wanted to give to me to spend how I wished in the ministry. And they gave me the right to spend $100,000. And they took me to the bank and made me a signatory on their bank account and gave me a checkbook. Can you believe this? And I had a lot of fun writing checks to the glory of God <laughs> and spent their money for them. No questions asked. The first thing I did was put the bulk of it straight into the building fund of the church. And from there it got spent on all kinds of things. But somebody actually gave me the right to sign checks for their company and spend their money. Now that's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. So you, when you're in a prayer meeting or praying at home, you have this conscious sense, I'm in Christ and I'm a servant of God. And when I pray, I'm serving him, I'm representing the heart of Jesus, the will of Jesus, the love of Jesus, and I'm presenting it to the Father because Jesus loves these people. It's Jesus' will to change this world. It's Jesus' will for the gospel to go to the nations. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. And it's, that's the basis on which we believe. Who we are in Christ, who Christ is in us, and we have the right to represent Jesus. So it's a, it's, in other words, it's really it's his prayer we're praying and not our prayer we're praying. And it means something a whole lot more like that. Now, of course, the name of Jesus is a big deal. It's a big thing. Um, it's not a place, it's a person. The place you're meant to be is in the person. But when you're in the person, you get the right to use his name. That's, that's pretty wonderful. And um, I, I just thank God for it. And then once you have the use of his name, it's more than that. His name is simply representing a whole lot of things that he does for you. I thank God. Well, anyway, praying in the name. I mean, you could talk for weeks about just praying in the name. So thrilling. Such a thrilling thing. There's another scripture. It's in Psalm oh, 66, I think, or Psalm 60, somewhere in that range. You'll find it where David says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What does it mean to regard iniquity? It means to have darkness in there and you know it's dark, but you won't give it up. You won't confess it. You hide it. You love it. It's your besetting sin, but you hang cling on to it. This greatly hinders your prayers. No, our relationship with the Lord is free flowing when we are healthy enough to freely confess to the Lord what we are, what we're not, and open these things up to him. Confession is very healing. Moving on. Rela number four, relationships. Power in getting prayer answered is very much dependent, contingent upon your attitude to other people. You want two examples? One, Jesus said, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against Anyone. Let me tell you, there's no greater hindrance to getting a prayer answered than you carry unforgiveness or bitterness or resentment, you know, or jealousy or something like that in your heart or you're full of accusations, attitudes to other people, but especially unforgiveness is a killer. And then the Bible also says in another place, it's instruction to men. It says, men, um, respect your wives so that your prayers will not be hindered. That's a tough one. Oh, forget that one. No. No, respect your wives. Live with her as the, as the weaker vessel and uh, in an understanding way. No, no, there's, there's big room for prayer there. Big room for prayer. 
but relationships. Remember relationships, your heart toward people, your attitude toward people, especially within the family and especially unforgiveness toward anyone. So what do you do when you come to pray? Check your heart. Am I, am I right with God? Am I up to date with, you know, in these things? Just, just make sure you're clean so that your faith isn't hindered. Now, two more. They're easy. Number five, listen to this verse. If we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have the thing that we asked of him. We find this in 1 John 5, um, 13 and 14, I think. Oh, some people stop right there. Ah, pray according to the will of God. I don't know what the will of God is. Or they'll say, oh, you only get prayers answered if it's the will of God. So then they start praying, Lord, if it be thy will. That's a dumb prayer. You're very unlikely to get that prayer answered if you're praying, Lord, heal, heal my sick cat if it be thy will. You know? But we are believing for a sick cat to be healed because I've got a special request here from Sarah. Right? Are we believing, Sarah? You and me for that cat? Yeah, very good. So, <laughs> however, there's no good praying if it be thy will. All that does is kill faith. Well, what does it mean he, if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us? Look, 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 look. This was written so you'd have confidence because the, the bit I didn't quote you from the verse, the opening bit says, and this is the confidence we have. That if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we have the thing. It's meant to be a verse that gives you great confidence to pray. Why? Because there's so much we know to be the will of God. The salvation of souls. The healing of people. The, you know, the meeting of needs of little children and wives and mums and families and cities and nations. And You talk about huge scope. How can you know better the will of God? Well, let Christ abide in you because he reveals it by his spirit. Let his word remain in you because if you really know his word, oh, it so opens up your heart and mind just to have an immediate sense of the will of God. It makes it so easy to pray. You'll find the Lord is a lot more willing in a lot more things than you ever figured he was. It's astounding, really. It's no wonder. You know, I've had all kinds of prayers answered. The things that... Out of a poverty mentality, you'd think, well, the Lord would never do that. All along, he wanted to do it. And when I took the time to pray about it, boom. No, the Lord is much more willing than you imagine. But finally, the active ingredient, and you all know what it is, right? I could ask every single person here today, what is the active ingredient? Condition number six. What is the one thing you must do to get prayers answered? And it is, everybody can say with one word, it is faith. It is be the believing component. And so could I suggest, every time you pray, please don't say amen without saying, Lord, I believe. And say, you've heard my prayer. You're answering my prayer. Oh, Lord, thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing the answer to this prayer. And keep saying it every day because that's the active ingredient. You know, if you buy a bottle of shampoo that gets rid of dandruff, doesn't matter what the brand is, ZP11, Revlon, or Selsun, or some of those, and you look at the fine print, it'll say there's an active ingredient. And it'll tell you it's only 1%. But you take that active ingredient out of that thing, you're not going to get, the, get rid of your dandruff. What's the other 99% for? Presumably just to make you feel better, look better, and smell better. But there's 1% in there designed to get rid of the dandruff. Well, look. There's one thing in prayer that you better include if you really want prayers answered. You have to believe God. You have to say, Lord, I believe you've heard my prayer. I believe you love to answer prayer. I thank you we're going to see your grace. And if you will live like that, think like that, talk like that, include it everywhere in your prayers, you'd be amazed what the Lord does in answer to believing prayer. All right, I close by reading a scripture. Deuteronomy 10. Chapter 12 and 13, for the last two days, as I'm going back to my Bible and sitting and reading this, two verses over and over and over. Anyway, let it, let it be taken to your own heart. It says, And now, O Israel, that's you, 
What does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear God. To fear the Lord your God. To walk in all his ways. To love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. For your own good. There was nothing the Lord ever commanded man that was not for his own good. And you begin with the first. What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God? I realize when I read that, we often say, with respect to our service to one another and to other people, you know, in father-son relationships, in community, all that. Like when I teach around the world, teach people how to be sons, I say, look, at, even to older ministers like myself, I say, there's never a time when you don't want a spiritual father. And it's not because you might need fathering or correction or even advice, although you can get all of that. No, it's because it doesn't matter how old you are, you always need someone over you in the Lord whom you can love, whom you can serve, and whom you can honour. And this love and serve and honour one another, I, I preach this everywhere. But I realise in this verse, this is how we're also called to respond to the Lord, except instead of it saying honour, it says fear. Why? Because with the Lord another component comes in, and that is reverence and worship. It's reverential fear. It's not the kind of fear you get from occultism or a, a horror flick. No, this is holy ground and so beautiful. Reverential fear inspires worship and awe and praise. So you look at it again. What is the Lord you God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God? To walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. So friends, back to our prayers, and back to the prayer meeting, but all the more determined, you know, to rejoice over the word of God and to believe God, and take a hold of all he has for us. So pray with me. Father, I thank you for the plans that you have. You said to a people long ago, it was to Israel in exile, you said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And I thank you this is ever the, the word and the will of God to us all. And I thank you, you have plans for central Queensland, you have plans for Queensland, you have plans for Australia, you have plans for many nations. You have plans for us and our city. And we seek your face for the unfolding of those plans and the building up of the city of God all across the region. That you would remove and knock out of place everything that does not make for peace and everything that resists the glory of Christ. And I ask, Lord, that you would establish your glory in central Queensland and beyond that you'd take a hold of this whole state for the sake of your name, and that you'd put your name here. Put your name here, O oh God, and bring honour to that name, and lift up your people. And I ask, O oh Lord, that you would not raise elders in every, not only raise elders in every place, but that you would raise for us a regional eldership. A great, a great eldership over the whole region of central Queensland. Raise this eldership, O oh God, I pray. And now lay your hand on every believer here today. Lay your hand on every man, every woman, every young person and put into every one of them the spirit of prayer and the spirit of faith and grant to every one of them the grace to see the way they're ahead and take hold of God and see good things come for their families and for the city and for the region and for the nation and for the gospel and for your people everywhere. So we put our faith in God today. Lord, that you'd enlarge every heart, I pray. Show us your purpose all the more clearly. I ask you, Lord, begin to speak. Begin to speak to the, all, the, all the godly women we have and all our 
all our men and all our young men and young women, speak to them, Lord, of the things to come. Show visions. Give a sense of your purpose to educate us as a people and to educate our prayers, to direct us in the way we believe. And Lord, we choose to believe today you will transform the city and the region and family life and the government of Christ will be established more and more in this region. And so we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're here our prayers. And now may grace be upon every home, your grace on every heart, your grace on every marriage and all our children, grace upon the days to come. My brothers and sisters, I bless you in Jesus' name. May the favour of God be upon you and the heavens be opened over you. May he reveal himself to you and establish his word in your hearts and answer all your prayers. May you taste of the good things of the Lord, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit rise up in you. The Lord establishes authority in you and in your word and bless you and grant you peace and peace to all your children. And so I bless you this day in the name of Jesus. Now, is there anybody present who doesn't know the Lord? Anybody present who's never surrendered their heart Jesus, this is your moment. Before we close today, take this moment. Just say, Lord, I want to know you. Would you come to me? Ask the Lord to forgive you your sins. To wash away your sin and your guilt and to make you whole and clean. Ask him to do this and to reveal himself to you and to take up your cause. To put your life, everybody now, put your life in the hands of Jesus. Make this choice right now. I commend you to his grace. May the Lord hear you and receive you. Amen. 